Uh, we start the last uh, lecture of uh, this morning with the talk by Christine Richter from the University of uh, Sergi Pontoise in France, and she's going to talk about uh, photo emission spectroscopy. So, Christine, it's for you. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, so, I will talk about photo emission spectroscopy. Just don't hesitate to interrupt me. Um, because sometimes my microphone doesn't work very well or if you have questions, if I go too fast or whatever. Just relaxed on teaching session. I think you're all a bit in a holiday mood, as I understand. Um, it's nice weather there and, and you enjoy your stay. So my uh, summary is really um, quite simple. I will talk about uh, photo mission, XPS and then different types of office. So, um, of course, we have to do some historical introduction. Um, the first, let me see how that works. I just get rid of this. Okay. This is here. Okay. I don't have the whole screen, but I guess you have it. Um, yeah, okay. So historically, uh, what's really important is the photoelectric effect, and um, several uh, scientists worked on that. And finally, Einstein um, did the explanation by um, by posing uh, by by saying that photons are quantized. And this was the first experimental evidence for quantization of light, um, and he got the Nobel Prize in physics for in, in 1921 for this. So the next. Um, I would say historical, historically important step was the work by Kai Siegbahn from Sweden, who got the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1981 for his work on um, on, on ETA, ele electron spectroscopy for chemical analysis. So with this, I come to the uh, XPS, X-ray photoemission spectroscopy. Um, this is uh, an X-ray photon going in onto the matter of interest and and electrons coming out. So here you have the the sketch of the energy levels and the matter, core electrons, then the val valence electrons, Fermi level, vacuum level, the work function between the two, and the X-ray photon when the, will then carry out structure into the vacuum and they the electrons will be detected as a function of their kinetic energy and you will get an intensity structure which um, which is a replica of the density of states inside um, the, the matter so you will not only get those you will get a sort of background which you see here of secondary electrons which are the electrons electrons which scatter inelastically on their way out of um, of the crystal, and then you have a typical spectrum here, uh, XPS spectrum, uh, the binding energy, which you uh, get by subtracting from the photon energy, uh, subtracting from the kinetic energy of the, of the photo electron, um, uh, the photon energy. Then you have the binding energy. It should be negative, but well, okay. So you see the different peaks in here. So just um, maybe I get just rid of the laser pointer because um, I can't shift this right. I don't see the ah oh, now yeah okay. Let's see the whole screen. Okay, so here you have then the different peaks uh, corresponding to the um, core electrons for nickel. So this example is nickel. So um, the 3p, the 3s, and here the, the 2p uh, levels, so which are spin orbit split. Um, and if you look at, at the zoom of this uh, zone, you get those two peaks, 2p3 half one half of nickel, which have a certain width, so 
guitar, which depends on the lifetime on instrumental resolution, and then you have an additional um, peak here, which gives information uh, about okay, uh, about uh, the um, the screening in the valence band. So this is the, the famous six electron volt satellite of of nickel, which comes from the screening done by either S or, or D orbitals. So this is um, now uh, what you can use XPS for is to do a chemical analysis and this is really nicely shown in this uh, silicon 2P core level peaks and you see this silicon is in bonds with fluorine you have uh, fluorine 1, 2, or 3, so different oxidation states, and you see that there's a chemical shift because in the valence band there are uh, then um, less electrons, and you can do this chemical analysis of, um, of the elements which you have on your surface. So um, the uh, photomission technique is highly surface sensitive, uh, which is shown here by this mean free path. Uh, lambda is a function of electron energy. So you see for different elements, you have more or less, um, uh, uh, you have them more or less around a, a curve, which is called the universal curve. So for even for different is you always have more or less uh, the same mean free path, which means that the, the depth from which the photoelectrons come is very, uh, very small and it differs, uh, it, it, it changes uh, quite uh, strongly with the electron energy. Um, so, in order to measure the uh, kinetic energy of the electrons, we use um, uh, mostly a hemispherical analyzer. A hemispherical analyzer, that means that you have two hemispheres. Between the two, you have a potential difference. And the electrons which get emitted from the interaction region, which means from the sample, they get focalized by a system of lenses, electrostatic lenses, onto the entrance lens of this analyzer. And then um, the uh, electric field, which is run um, between the two analyzers, will give uh, the trajectory of the electron with a, with a given um, kinetic energy um, possible to come out on the exit slit. And um, the um, resolution for this analyzer is given uh, amongst others, uh, not only the slit width, but as well the radius of this medium radius. So this is the instrument we, we mostly use for photo emission. And here I, I show you which X-ray source we use for um, um, uh, in the laboratory. So mostly in the laboratory we have an X-ray source which gives us, um, which is either from the aluminium or, or from the magnesium. So um, this is quite simple. The, uh, there's a, an electron beam accelerated towards an aluminium sample uh, or substrate and uh, that then will eject um, the X-ray radiation. So the electron, uh, in this case it's 12,000 uh, volts, will uh, create a hole in the K shell, and this hole will then be um, will then be filled up and emit radiation. And here you see that just the general uh, curve of the radiation which is emitted. This is for for, for heavier material. But you can see that on top of this bench column, you have a couple of um, lines, and the strongest lines are the alpha lines. That's the ones we, we use. So uh, in the case of aluminium, you have here these alpha one, alpha two lines, which uh, give 
the total width of one electron volt of radiation. And that is then radiation in one, at 1486 electron volts. So with this I come to um, the office um, angle result photomission spectroscopy. Um, which gives the possibility to map the electronic structure in the reciprocal space. So what you need now is a, is a monocrystalline sample. And um, here you see uh, the electron analyzer, which I've just shown. It's used to um, filter the electrons, which are uh, ejected at a certain angle. So you choose the angle, either you choose it by, by the Building of a sample, or if you have normal emission, you look at normal emission, and then at the exit, you have a certain range in which you can see the uh, angular interval in, on one picture. So the exit uh, slit is replaced by a two dimensional detector, and here you have in the direction parallel to the, to the entrance slit, you have then the angle of the emitted. Uh, electrons and in the perpendicular direction you have the kinetic energy. So the, the, the faster of the electrons, the further they will be um, outside. So this um, this is uh, the, the general sketch which you have seen before for this uh, office studies and here uh, again the, um, the picture of uh, density of states and uh, core levels of the material and then uh, the spectrum we obtain by the electron which is coming out of the material and which uh, of course uh, of, uh, obeys the concentration of energy so the kinetic energy of the electrons is the photon energy minus the binding energy minus the wave function. So this is um, then the binding energy which is measured uh, with respect to Fermi level. Now you have in addition uh, the conservation of momentum. So this means uh, the K vector, uh, the K vector which is shown here inside the solid and this is the K vector which is outside uh, the solid. And um, you see that the green component, which is the component which is parallel to the sample surface, this is conserved. This is the same inside and outside the crystal. So it's simply given by the kinetic energy of the electron and the theta angle. But the um, momentum perpendicular to the surface is not conserved. So this is clear um, that there is uh, some potential barrier which has to be overcome uh, by, by the electron. So this is a much more difficult um, task to find your um, your symmetry points in the Poyoin um, zone. In order to find them, what you have to do is a photon energy scan and then uh, find out where you have some points of symmetry and you can expand this version and then um, fit, find out what the um, inner potential is. So this is of course a very simplistic model to, to, to say the electrons that come from the inner, inner potential and this, but this is a method which will give you a um, good idea about the, about the K uh, perpendicular um, value of your electrons and if you are interested in two-dimensional samples then you will not be bothered by this um, particular component and you will directly be able to map the k-space of 
wir alle mit uns im Zeichen gesetzt haben. So, here you just see in one picture the um, hemispherical analyzer with the entrance um, electrostatic uh, lens system and the dimensional picture of the upper spectrum on this detector. So, if you have a three, well, an electron, the electron states are uh, represented by this uh, arc. Colloid, then your spectrum will give you a cut of this, which will make you this parabola. Um, this uh, energy as a function of k vector uh, in a given direction. So now I show you our instrument, SLE, which we use. Um, so you've already, I think that Jan has already shown you pictures um, like this. We have here preparation chamber and we have done the analysis chamber and here you see the spherical analyzer which I have mentioned and the top analyzer, a kind of light electron analyzer, different type of analyzer. And this is um, a dry vacuum um, uh, uh, chambers. So you see the preparation chamber is very important because you have um, the requirement that the sample surface is clean um, because of this um, surface sensitive technique, uh, you have to make sure that, that your sample is A, uh, monocrystalline, and B, uh, very clean. And this is what you do usually in the preparation chamber. You can apply the cycles of iron, beam, iron bombardment with, uh, with heating to uh, obtain a, a nice crystalline surface. And then you transfer under ultra high vacuum conditions the sample from this chamber to the other chamber and, and you measure it before it gets heated again. So, um, just to say, we have different um, sources of radiation for, um, for our fist. And these different sorts of radiation, they imply a little bit uh, the energy scales of the photoelectrons which we're looking at. Um, so uh, we may use uh, uh, the laser in a, in a home lab, which would then be the third and the fourth, or the fourth, or both the fourth harmonic of a titan sapphire laser. And this will give you, uh, situate your energies in this uh, rosy area. Or you use a uh, helium lamp, so that's what we use, use very, very frequently, the helium lamp which gives you 21 electron volts radiation or uh, that's the first line, or another line which is 40 electron volts, and that'll situate you more in this uh, region. And here you see it's quite a big difference in the uh, elastic beam free path, um, which is um, it's because you have a logarithmic scale here. So with a laser you go this laser you, you go much deeper. You can go really much deeper into, into the material. So then of course there's the synchrotron, synchrotron light um, is a very important source of, um, of photons. Uh, because it gives you the possibility to continuously change the photon energy. In addition, there are things like changing uh, polarization. And you have uh, the, the choice of, of this by applying at a, a specific beam line. Um, so that's the disadvantage that you need to go there. Have, uh, have a project which is accepted. So, on, so you have little time to 
the amendments. So you want to do uh, as much as you can in the laboratory with laboratory uh, sources. So now I have here a, a picture of the uh, density of photon emission, how you write that um, in terms of from the scale rule. So this is um, this is certainly what you've already studied quite a lot in this um, summer school. So you have the intensity um, direct directly written um, in terms of the Fermi Golden Rule um, with the delta function, which gives you uh, the conservation of energy, and then the Hamiltonian interaction. Hamiltonian between the initial and the final state. So now the initial state uh, is, uh, for example, an electron state, and the final state is uh, the product between the uh, photo electron state with, uh, with the uh, final n minus one, one n minus one. State. So here um, you have for the initial state you can write that as product of of the uh, of an electron, a uh, single electron multiplied with an n minus one state, and this n minus one state, this is uh, an electron annihilation operator applied to the n electron uh, state. So this is in general not an eigenfunction of the Hamiltonian, whilst this is the final n minus one state. This is an eigenfunction. And now you can write this um, expression as a product of two parts. So one is the one electron dipole matrix element, and you have here the electron uh, in the initial and the final state, and that gives you the interaction with the light. Uh, and this um, this matrix element is really uh, is sensitive to polarization of your of your light and it, it is uh, sensitive uh, geometry of the experiment and the other uh, um, product the other um, is is um, actually the overlap overlap of the removal of an electron from the initial state with the eigenstate of the minus one system so this contains uh, the information of the electronic state together with its interactions. Interactions which are electron-electron interactions and electron-phonon or other boson interaction. And this part is expressed by the spectral function. So here the intensity expressed again. Uh, the um, matrix element module squared multiplied with a spectral function and uh, an additional function of uh, Fermi Dirac giving you the probability of uh, occupation of the state. So here again, uh, now uh, concentrating on the spectral function, or, or better call it uh, one electron removal spectral function. Um, so this can be basically expressed in this form, so this looks like a Lorentzian function, and you see what's important here is the sigma prime and the sigma double prime, and, um, and uh, the position uh, in uh, of, of this uh, Laurentian will be shifted with respect to the bare band, the, the one electron uh, picture, which you get from without interaction by uh, by the value of sigma prime and sigma that the point will give you the width of this. So what you obtain if you have interaction is, is a quasi particle. Um, so the sigma I've already mentioned is the electron itself energy with the real and the imaginary part of it. And it's a Lorentzian centered at 
at epsilon k plus sigma prime for the line width of sigma p1. So those are the real imaginary part. And uh, if you have uh, strong interactions, what you have in addition to this Lorentzian is some transfer or a spectral transfer to a lower binding energy, uh, higher binding, sorry, higher binding energy a peak. Um, so you multiply this normalized uh, function with the zk, zk being between uh, 0 and 1. And you add that one, one minus z times the incoherent part. So this is called incoherent part. And that means, so to make the story, long story short, that means that for an electron band, a simple band, which you can uh, approximately calculate without your uh, interaction, so with the electron without the direction, then you get for the different k points in which you measure, um, you get just uh, delta functions or just just a peak, a simple peak. And for an interacting system, the simple peak will be replaced by the spectral function, which is shifted with respect to this uh, simple curve and which has got a certain width. And it's got, in addition, maybe this, um, this incoherent part. So this is what you will measure in photo emission, which means that the photo emission with the office gives you all the information about your uh, your electronic um, state plus its interaction. So now I give you an example. So I just try not to go too fast. So if there are any questions in between, as I said, don't hesitate. It's a bit strange to, to speak to my computer and not have any um, you know, uh, reaction from the audience. Uh, OK, so uh, an example for an alpha spectrum I, I, will, I will show you is um, is the couple, couple of one 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 surface. There is a surface state you have already seen that it's a so-called choppy state, which is formed because well, which is formed. It is formed in the gap of um, of, of the of the bulk states. So uh, the gap at the L point. And um, so you, you can see here. So this is a, it's a nice parabola. And here is the projected pipe band. Um, and this has been measured, of course, quite some time ago with helium uh, radiation or the helium lamp. 21 electron volts. You see this nice parabola. And later it was measured as well with a, with a six electron volt laser. You can see here the, the six electron volt laser. So this is the Fermi surface, uh, the Fermi surface, which is just um, cut here of the uh, paraboloine. So here you have energy as a function of a parallel. And if you look at the constant energy, Fermi energy, and you show now k parallel x uh, and k parallel y. So here's a k y k x for this constant energy. You get a circle. And you see for the laser the data, the circle exactly superposed to the circle from helium. Um, measurements, but it is smaller, and it's got an additional structure. Uh, so now, if you look at this uh, this part here, close to Fermi level, um, 
then you see that this uh, parabola, or, or here's a straight line, it's not quite a straight line. So close to Fermi, it deviates from the straight line, and that's shown by this arrow here. So there's a kink, the so-called kink, and this kink means there are directions uh, between the electron and phonons, and this is nicely shown by the extraction of the self-energy, the real part, and the imaginary part, and you see that in, a, in an area of about 30, a milli-electron volt below Fermi level, which is just this part here, uh, you can uh, extract some phonon modes. So, in addition, you see that there's a splitting, and the splitting comes from the fact, and we've seen that as well before, that uh, this parabola is uh, spin polarized. So it's spin split, it's a, it's a Rushford state, which is spin split, and this, this is due to the fact that um, this is due to the fact that the surface breaks the symmetry of the crystal, and uh, there is an electric field or a gradient of potential perpendicular to the surface, and that gives you a spin splitting with the spins being parallel to the surface. And this spin splitting can be observed with this really good resolution because it's, it's really very, very small and copper. I will show you that again too, or just a little bit later for, for both. So now, in order to uh, summarize a little bit this, these uh, applications of office, I have here um, advantages and limitations. So uh, office gives you the direct information about the electronic space, and you have high resolution and energy and moment uh, spaces. Uh, this technique shows us wall interaction. Directions, I can help you help you from the both or generally both on the directions. And it is a surface sensitive probe, which can be an advantage. But it can as well be a disadvantage. If you want to look at varied interfaces, then you may uh, want to use, for example, Huxpes. I've shown you in the graph before. Huxpes is hard. Um, actually for the emission spectroscopy and because of the high energy then you're more bulk sensitive you can be back to the material so then um, we've seen that um, ARPIS requires a, a very clean atomically flat surface of the monocus line samples so you need ultra high vacuum and this is of course uh, a requirement which uh, which demands some some heavy instrumentation. Um, another disadvantage is that we need uh, samples uh, samples which are more or less conductive uh, on, on substrates as well. You need uh, to be able to replace the charge which is going out. Um, the electrons which reach the sample, you need to be able to replace them. And um, and uh, so so insulators are, are difficult to measure. They are they breaks to even with a, with an electron flux gun. You can uh, you can as well measure measure insulators and replace the charge, neutralize the the, the charge uh, sample. So one disadvantage is that you cannot do any studies as a function of the magnetic field. That will just change the electron trajectory and reduce all the information. So now um, I come to the next um, point of office. The next type of office is the spin-resolved office. 
So the spin we are really interested in the spin of the electrons uh, already for spintronics for the application for the find uh, uh, to, to advance uh, electronics find spin porous states. So which we find of course in magnetic materials. And um, to measure the spin of free electron is not at all trivial. So uh, in, your, in your quantum mechanics lectures, you you know you have the stern gerlach apparatus. When you introduce to the spin of uh, of particles, you learn that the stern gerlach will give you the possibility to determine this uh, spin, but it doesn't work uh, with free electrons. So um, we need polarimeter. The, um, the first polarimeter which was developed is the MOD uh, detector. The MOD detector works as follows. Um, it is the scattering of a spin polarized uh, electron from a pot, from a, from gold pilot, which is gold. What you need is a, is a heavy uh, atom because actually what uh, that what you have then is an asymmetry between light, right and left uh, scattering as for, for a given spin for a given spin perpendicular to the scattering plane. So here it is the coupling between the spin and the orbital momentum of the orbit of the electron in, in the field of, of the nucleus which was scattered, which is here the gold gold nucleus. So, uh, in order to have uh, a visible size of this coupling, you need a big angular momentum, which means you accelerate the electron to, um, to at least 30,000 uh, electron volts, which is quite, demands quite a, quite a high tension, and which can be a little bit tricky experimentally. And um, in addition, you want to have a, a heavy, a highly charged uh, Atom, and uh, this is some material which is a screen that's, that's gold. So, this is the MOD detector, which will give you the possibility to determine by measuring the asymmetry between right and left um, detectors to determine the polarization of the electrons in the direction which is perpendicular to the scattering. Now an electron polarization vector has got three components, um, the three directions in space. So the mod detector, it, it, can, it usually has got four detectors, right, left, and up, down. That, that gives you two components. So if you want to add three, you need a second mod detector. But the efficiency of su such a mod detector is not, is not that great which means it needs a lot of counts, a lot of electrons in order to get a reasonable signal. So there is a, a younger detector which is more convenient to use, which um, works on the basis of low ex energy exchange scattering. So here you have a ferromagnetic material with the oxidized iron, and you will um, magnetize that uh, by coils, two, two coil uh, systems. So the coil 2 will magnetize it in this direction, it's called mu 2 here, and the coil 1 in the direction mu 1. And what you do then, um, in order to um, determine the component of the spin of your electron uh, uh, parallel to mu 2, then you will change uh, the magnetic, the magnetization from one direction to the other. So if you look at the contrast between uh, I1 minus I2, which is uh, one direction minus the other direction, then you get this component, and you get the, the other component, both um, in plane of this um, substitute sample, the other component. So, so here you get two components. So that's how it looks. Um, you have the electron beam coming, uh, getting polarized by an electric 
by, by a system of uh, electrospheric lenses to this um, to this uh, thermomagnetic uh, uh, sample which gets magnetized and then you measure in a given direction just one direction with the channel from the intensity for different after different magnetizations so uh, here what you then uh, determine is the asymmetry which is i1 minus i2 uh, magnetization one direction minus magnetization opposite direction divided by the sum so um this asymmetry gives you then the polarization of this component. The polarization is the asymmetry divided by what is called the Sherman function. So Sherman function, the, the name is not really well chosen because it's not really the function, it's just the, the constant actually. So it's usually around 0 0.3, which means that if you arrive with a 100% polarized beam on this, um, on this detector, you will get an asymmetry of 30 percent. So now we have here for this detector um, the figure of merit. The figure of merit is something that's really important for a detector. It gives you sort of gives you uh, the efficiency of it. So you want to be in the maximum of the figure of merit. So this is given here as a function of scattering potential, which means the uh, kinetic energy of the electron uh, being scattered from the back scattered from, from, this, uh, from this target. So here it's around six electron volts. That's where, where you work. And then you look at the asymmetry for this for this uh, uh, for, for this kinetic energy you have an asymmetry Corresponds to the of, uh, of zero point three, and um, and what else? And you have um, you have of course the uncertainty uh, the of the of your polarization. So once you have the polarization. So here, just to point out, uh, to compare the uh, figure of merit of this exchange um, spin detector with the mod detector, the mod detector has, has a figure of merit of 0.5 times minus 4, and this one of uh, above 80 times 10 minus 4. So there's roughly a factor of 40, which, the, uh, which this detector is more favorable as compared to the mod detector. So that's how it looks like in the lab. So I've already shown you this picture. Here's the hemispherical analyzer. So the uh, electrons go through, get, get filtered on energy, and then they are taken to the spin detector, which is here. So here you see the sketch. You have uh, the sample, the entrance lens system, focalizing and then slip off the hemispherical analyzer and then the electrons go on to the CCD detector in order to measure alpha spectra and if we want to measure the spin in, in one direction or k space we have the electron going through a, an aperture here on the exit that they are taken by a system of lenses taken around uh, 90 degrees and then they pinch on the um, on the detector, spin detector. So in order to characterize uh, characterize our spin detector, we uh, used the uh, Shockley surface state of gold one one one. So I've showed I've shown you the surface state of copper. 111, so for gold you have an equivalent one. So as I told you already, and as you've seen before, this is a spin polarized split 
it's a wash pass state which is uh, just split and spin. So the spin uh, direction it is uh, tangent to this circular um, constant energy surfaces and uh, the spin from one from the outer to the inner parabola of paraboloid is just changing direction. So in our office picture, we have this parabola. And now, um, at the moment, we can see, we see this thing here, this, this one. And now we cut um, in this particular point of case space. We will measure now the uh, energy distribution curves. And we will obtain this um, energy distribution curve, which means um, that we have the two signals which correspond to the two uh, magnetization directions of one of the coil one. So um, to get the the geometry right of this. Uh, the theta angle, which is the k vector here, uh, sorry, which is the k vector here, that's the theta angle or the k vector here, this is uh, parallel to the slit, so the slit, the entrance slit is parallel to the y, it's, it's that the direction of, the, of y, uh, in this uh, system of coordinates, and then we, um, then that means that if we cut this parabola along y, then we will have here the spin direction will then have an x direction, should have an x direction, no y direction. So um, if you look now at, um, at our ge geometry, you see that the sample here for normal emission um, has got, uh, is given by the x y direction. So the spin will be either x or y, or well, it will have x and y components, but not no z component. So if you if you look at, at the spin detector, uh, the coils, I, I told you that the magnetization by the coils that will give you the directions of the of the polarization, the, the components of the polarization which we can measure, and this will be then a coil one and coil two measuring uh, the Z and the y direction. So, with other words, we, we cannot really measure the x direction. We need a second detector. Or there's one trick which is done here in this, um, uh, in this uh, lens system. There's a rotator lens. The rotator lens which will rotate the spin in the plane perpendicular to propagation uh, plus or minus 45. That means that if you have the spin in the x direction, the rotator lens will then turn it 45 degrees up, and that will give it a positive z component, uh, y component, sorry, uh, or a negative y component. And this rotator lens so gives us the possibility to have access to all three components of. And this is what is shown here. So if we change now the rotation from plus 1 to minus 1, which means from plus 45 degrees to minus 45 degrees, you swap effectively the uh, uh, polarization of the um, of measured uh, electrons. So from this, and, and rotation zero gives uh, no effect, which is normal. And um, and that's that will give us our asymmetry. And from the asymmetry, we get the polarization. So here we have the polarization 
which is the polarization for only one component now. It's the X component. And we have here a simulation of our data, well, of, of, the, this, uh, of the spectrum. And, and it, uh, it fits well, more or less well. So this was then, and, and then once you've got the polarization, of course, what you're interested in are the uh, spin uh, polarized um, spectra. So you have the blue and the red spectrum, which is obtained by adding the polarization one by one with total intensity divided. So these are the, the, the polarized spectra. So that's how the um, polarization analysis functions. So it works quite well. And now I give you uh, an example of spin polarized uh, data, which is which is a study on tungsten diselenide. So tungsten diselenide is a TMDC material. TMDC means transition metal dicalcogenide. It is a layered material. As you can see here, it's like uh, uh, graphite, uh, graphite uh, consisting of uh, lots of layers of graphene, you can say. And with the discovery of graphene, people were really, uh, very, but really interested in this layered materials because graphene, as you know, is not a semiconductor, and so for for building components. Um, they would search for what dimensional materials which would be semiconducting, and people uh, discovered the, the huge, uh, huge amount of TMDC materials. And being layered means that you can exfoliate, exfoliate um, single tri layers, and um, and then work with that. So here, this is a study of of uh, spin polarized office, spin sensitive office, uh, spin resolved office. Uh, all these materials they have a hexagonal structure seen from above. So you have the tungsten in between uh, two solenoids layers. That's that forms a tri layer. And now the tungsten is slightly uh, deplaced from the middle, so there is a dipole moment, which is in the layer. And um, overall, this material is inversion symmetric. So if you have an inversion symmetric material, you do not have any spin polarized, spin polarized states in there. So you remember the rush bar state, that is spin polarized, uh, that's spin polarized splitting, because um, we have a surface which um, cuts the um, um, which destroys this inversion symmetry. And um, here you have inversion symmetry, but uh, the unit cell contains two layers. So in within the two layers, have offset electric fields, and that means uh, you, you can have the spin polarization, but the spin polarization between the two layers then must be opposed to each other. And the direction of the spin polarization must be out of plane. So we have electric field in plane, the direction of the spin polarization is out of plane, and it's supposed between the two layers. And this has been measured in the study. Here you see the band structure, and you see that the K point you have spin polarized balance bands, EB1 and EB2. And by um, measuring in, in the K-point the energy distribution curve, um, one obtains these two spectra for, for right and left scattering. It has been measured with a MOD detector, and, um, and one obtains this polarization. 
so this polarization is uh, the same energy, uh, the same, sorry, here, yes, energy scale here, so, so you have the two peaks of the events, they are here, and that is where the polarization is, is pretty, pretty high. And you can see that the polarization is opposed between the two balance bands. They have opposite polarization, one with respect to the other. And if you um, go from K to K prime, which means here is the Briand zone, in the corners you have K, K prime, K to prime, you have two inequivalent K points, then this distribution of polarization just swaps signs. So this study is a really nice study which shows the coupling between spin valley and lay degrees of freedom. And um, and it shows that in this inversion uh, symmetric system you can have really strong spin polarization. So this is um, this is a really nice example for showing the importance of spin polarized uh, office. So now, um, now I would like to mention as well the time reserved office. So we can have um, we can be interested. Well, time resolved office that means that we have a scheme of pump and probe. So you, um, you pump with uh, infrared or visible light such that the um, electrons get excited to a bound uh, state, which is usually unoccupied. And then you can look at this um, intermediate state by a probe. So the probe pulse then will be ultraviolet and and you will do this study with uh, the with pulsed light source. So the best pulsed light source is the pulsed laser. Well, there can be yeah, this pulsed laser system with the free electron laser. And, um, and frequently, uh, this, these studies are done, done with high harmonic generation photons, which means that the laser is just the fundamental photon is multiplied uh, by HHG. And then you obtain, oh my, oh yeah. then you obtain uh, photons uh, which will go up uh, to more than 100 electron volts. And you have uh, pulse durations, which give you your, your time the resolution uh, of the order of femtoseconds. And you want uh, as high as possible repetition rate in order to have uh, enough photons, but not too many photons per shot, because if you have too many photons per shot, you will uh, produce the charge effects, space charge effects, which you, which you don't want to transmission because they would deviate uh, the direction of your, of your photoelectrons. So uh, now uh, what you change here is the delta T. This is the delay between the pump and the probe. Because then you can see how this uh, intermediate uh, excited state will, will uh, develop. With pump. And uh, in this picture, you see a couple of uh, office spectra. So it's the energy as a function of the parallel vector for a negative time delay. So, negative time delay that means that the probe um, arrives before the pump which means the probe arrives and, and the material is not pumped, it's not excited. So uh, then you get the ground state RFS, which is shown here, by this, uh, this colors here, and then 
uh, for 0.7 picoseconds delay between pump and probe. You see that you have occupied all those states in this parabola. And looking later, you see there's a redistribution of occupation. So this is really uh, interesting to see what's going on in the electron dynamics. So here are some, some, some time scales. We have um, the time scales for electrons. Electron dynamics are all uh, of the order of femtoseconds. So below the femtoseconds. And, um, and the nuclear motion is, of course, much, much uh, slower. And you have um, nuclear motion like Thousands. Well, because just uh, as, as an idea, to, it takes it takes um, 150 attoseconds for an electron to circle around the nucleus uh, of an atom. So the attosecond is really is really uh, different physics to look at the uh, attosecond resolution. That's what we want to get to. But then, of course, if the shorter the pulses are, um, the higher the, the higher bandwidth of the radi radiation will lose the energy resolution. So with this, I come um, back to the same material uh, um, to give you an example of a study of a time resolved study. So this is uh, tungsten disolonite again. And here is again uh, a sketch of the electronic structure, now uh, in three dimensions. So here is the, uh, the ground state, which you have seen, now shown by these cups. So these cups, they correspond, they are in the k-points. They correspond to the two bands I've shown just before. So here, if you remember, this balance band 1 and balance band 2, it was. With a, with a splitting of 0.5 um, electron volts. So this is the ground state, and then uh, there are some valleys in the excited state. So this is uh, the state we will pump, uh, which has been pumped by a pump laser. Uh, and um, now the result of this office uh, the alpha spectra now for different relays between pump and probe are shown here. So this is a ground state um, alpha spectrum. And now um, after with 20, 20 20 seconds after the pump, you can nicely see the population of this valley in the cake point. So now, if you look how that develops over the time, you look uh, at 120 temp seconds, so just 100 temp seconds later, you can see that there is a transfer uh, of this occupation into the next valley, which is the which is called sigma here, which is a little bit deeper than this one. Uh, there is a transfer transfer of the And this means that there is intervalley scattering, which goes faster than 100 femtoseconds and populates states in the signal valley. So this is a very nice study, which I want to show you as an example for time-resolved optics. So let me see. My laser doesn't move anymore. I just give it some time. Give me the hint again to swap to the next transparency. Then so now it's not moving. Now it's not moving. So let me see. Do, do you hear me? Can can somebody tell me if, if you're there? Or have I done? 
No, no, you are still online, Christine. You are, what? You are still online. Okay, you, you can hear me. It's just my, my mouse is stuck, so it doesn't yeah, move. We can definitely hear you, Christine. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, great. So you can see a little point of the laser pointer. It's not, it's not uh, reacting to my mouse. So it's stuck, but um, so I just try to escape and get back, but escape doesn't work at the moment. So I can't change slides. Sorry, I'm stuck. Okay. And you cannot change slides with the arrows? Yeah, because you yeah, know the arrows don't work as soon as I'm uh, in this in this mode with a laser um, pointer. Uh, I always have to change them here in the left hand corner. But now I can't go to that because my my mouse is stuck. So basically, escape doesn't work. Um, Sorry, I don't hear you. So I think you have to uh, just uh, stop it and restart again. I mean, from this. Yeah, point. I have to. I mean, you know, escape doesn't work, uh, and I I don't have access to the. You cannot force quit the presentation. Yeah, no, it doesn't work. So I have to restart. I think. Sorry, that'll take a little bit of time, but I don't think I have a choice. Okay, now it's moving. Okay, got it. Fine. Sorry. Sorry for that. Right. So, now... Now what we'll, we really want is to do time and spin with the office. But now it becomes more tricky because we need um, we need lot, lots of counts for that. It's already for the time we roll, you need counts for spinning. Well, if you combine both, of course, it becomes more tricky. But um, this is what we want if you want to understand uh, the alpha fast demagnetization. We want to do um, time and spin result um, so, and you want to do that in the femtosecond uh, time resolution. So, um, here I would like to um, to give you the results we've obtained on uh, FE304, which is a half metal. So, a half metal, I just recall to you what that is. It is the material which is ferromagnetic to start with, and for one uh, direction of the spin you have metal, whilst for the other one you have a semiconductor or, or a insulator. So this is this is a half metal. Now there are several materials which are supposed to be half metals, but the experimental proof of half metallicity is absolutely not uh, not easy. So by doing, um, I just give you the, the, the very, very summarized uh, results of the study. By doing um, time and spin resolved studies on the system, we measure here uh, the relaxation of the photon excited state. Uh, it's been integrated. So you can see that the, the state we pump will, uh, in FE304, will uh, relax with a time constant we determined around 300 femtoseconds. Right. So then we measure as well the spin polarization um, of the system. It's spin polarized. And, um, uh, and and uh, if you look at the, the relaxation of the spin polarization with time, you find a different time constant, which means the spin uh, polarization is slower, um, uh, decays slower than uh, the excited uh, electron uh, relaxation. 
so the explication of this, which was of course a historical theoretical study, is summarized uh, in a very simple picture here. Um, it's just if you excite a metal, you contact what will happen to the uh, to the photo excited electrons is that they will be excited and lots of small steps very quickly just to the fundamental state. But if you excite a semiconductor or an insulator across the gap of course, then it will very very quickly relax to the bottom of this valley, excited state, but the de-excitation across the gap will take more time. And this just gives you the, um, the difference in, in, um, in speed of de-excitation for the two spins, which means that we really have a, a half metal. So this is a proof of half metallicity or a new approach allowing to test half metallicity. So this is just what I want to show you for uh, as an example of, uh, of the power of the spin and the time to resolve the initial measurements. So now I, I come to the, to the last point of my, um, of my session, is the uh, need for um, spatially resolved outputs. So uh, I've already told you that we are very interested in layered materials. And these layered materials, they are produced. Uh, well, in, in two-dimensional materials, really uh, thin layers. They are produced by different different ways. One is the mechanical exfoliation. It's the swatch tape method. It's the method graphene was um, was isolated with. Uh, the Nobel Prize uh, was given for this swatch tape method to a layer of graphene from some graphite example. So this is still uh, very important because um, one of the new uh, areas of interest is, is twisted bilayer materials. So in order to have a twisted bilayer, you have to take an exfoliate plate and put it on top of another exfoliate plate and then change the, the twist angle. And this will only be possible for uh, flakes of a certain size. So the monocrystalline domain will demand for really uh, uh, small spots of interest to do artists work, spatially involved artists. And there are two. Um, strategies to do spatial resolved uh, office. One is the photo emission electron microscope, or PEAM, called PEAM, or energy filter EF PEAM, um, which is sort of schematized here. So you have your sample, and from that you will uh, form uh, a real space image, which is shown here. But um, you will um, so um, form with the photo electrons a real space uh, image, but at a certain energy, you filter the energy. So in other words, you get the real space image for a certain energy of the photo electrons, and then you scan the energy, and that that means that in this real space image, you have for each pixel, you have a whole spectrum. Uh, um, of uh, photoelectron spectrum. And uh, that gives you the occasion to, on your sample, to choose the area of interest. And then you can change the mode of it to case space imaging and look at the, um, at the case space uh, of, this, of, of this area of interest. And then you get the so the case space in one picture, and again, uh, you change the energy. So for different energies, you get the 
cuts the space. And what is really attractive for this is that you have the case space, quite a big case space, what get uh, like easily more than a three-mile zone in one picture. And in order to get that, you need really high extraction fields, and this is one of the disadvantages. You have a very strong potential difference between the sample and the, end, and the entrance lens of this PEAM apparatus. And this PEAM apparatus really uh, works as, as shown here. You have uh, two hemispherical analyzers, one behind the other. Why do you have two? Because you have, like with all um, instruments, you have some aberrations produced from by the first one, and then these aberrations will be exactly compensated by the second one. So that's why you need to. So, um, so this is um, this is such a, a foamy surface you, you obtain. So you can see that you have in one person example now. I don't know which photon energy, but something something of a ten of electron maybe. Maybe helium lamp, probably, yeah, it's a helium lamp. Helium lamp 21 uh, electron volts as photon energy, and you see this um, uh, astronomy surface, which is bigger than one helium zone. And by the way, this is the Kappa 111 uh, surface, and you can refine this chocolate surface state, which I have shown you in one of the first uh, slides. A small circle here. So this is one of the strategies. The other uh, strategy is to use a um, the, the normal office um, analyzer, but to um, produce a very small spot of photons on the sample. So uh, and, and, and then you can scan the sample in the x y direction. So in order to have a really small spot uh, on the sample, you use a, a zone plate uh, with a pinhole for the synchrotron radiation, for example. And if you work with a laser, uh, visible or, or those ultraviolet, then you can use a lens. So the problem is just that you have to you have to put the lens really close to the sample in order to have a really small spot size of micrometer. Um, and this means that you have to put it inside the dry vacuum, you cannot align it, and you cannot what or all. And yet you have to be able to do to to obtain the vacuum. You need to heat the whole chamber, and so it's not, not that trivial. Really so now I'll show you uh, just uh, some recent results which were obtained from my layer group twisted by layer graphene, so it's called P E L E. So here you have the Briand zone of this graphene. Uh, you have the lower and, and the upper layer. And since it's, it's twisted, you have uh, this distance between the two A points, which is delta K. You have, um, so uh, the graphene gives you the Dirac cones and the K points and so you have the two Dirac cones which will hybridize, which will interact and um, and what you get actually from this position of these uh, two hexagonal patterns is a moiré pattern which will form a superstructure on your material. So you have here in with a with a, a white um, a losange, you have the uh, unit cell of graphene, and uh, the black losange gives you the unit cell of the superstructure of the Moiré pattern. So this superstructure with such a big uh, unit cell will then give you a really small rayon zone, which is shown here on the right. So the Briand zone is, is just formed by the K and by the two K points of the two layers. And then it will be small like this 
for for this number of seventeen point nine years. And um and um and in the study you have um the sample on uh boron nitride, hexagonal boron nitride, which is uh, always used to encapsulate protein and uh, as a substrate as well, to catch it from from the from the sub substrate. You have here the monolayer, the lower graphene monolayer, here you have the upper graphene monolayer, and in the area in between you have the twisted bilayer graphene. So this is shown on the sample from the micrograph. In this picture, uh, the, the colors are the same. So in the, the lila area, you have the twisted bilayer graphene. And this again, AFM, another image is AFM image here, the, the bilayer is the, is the lila one. So it's the same. So this is just turned a bit. And, uh, and, uh, and so what's, uh, what's here, uh, the ARPAS, interesting is it's the ARPAS uh, spectra. This is the ARPAS spectrum for the blue point and that's for the lila, lila point. So blue point, that means you are here in an area of of uh, the lower graphene monolayer. So you have this nice era cone. And, and for this uh, lila spot, you're in the area of the twisted bilayer graphene. And what you see uh, appearing here is so-called flat band. And this corresponds to the super lattice. Which is um, which is the Moiré pattern, and was theoretically predicted that for magic angles, twist angles, for which the the, the first is 1.1 degrees, um, you obtain these flat bands. So you obtain the mini um, bands, and they are for this magic angle, they are they are flat. That they have a very small bandwidth, with other, with other words, between 5 and 10 milli electron volts. The Fermi velocity at the direct points drops to zero. They have high effective mass and they are just highly localized electrons, which give you the possibility to do a, to do a, a thorough investigation on strongly correlated physics. So, um, as you know, uh, for, for this uh, first um, magic angle, uh, superconductivity was measured quite recently on such a twisted bilayer graphene sample. So this is this is something which is worth getting into. So for that really, uh, really small uh, spot of light, and then measure it with our Thanks very much, uh, Christine. Uh, so if there are any questions, please ask. Well, I, I have a, 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 a sort of stupid remark, but uh, um, some decades ago, or many decades ago, when I was a PhD student, I was doing some experiments and we were using channel trans. So I'm I'm a bit surprised that uh, you still use channel trans. Oh yeah, the channel trans, uh, of course. Uh, you have channel plates or channel trans, and the ch channel plate you use that if you want something which is um, which is either um, position, position sensitive or which um, has quite a high uh, amplification. Having said so, uh, yeah, channel trans, they are, they are excellent. So. They're not at all out of fashion. 
very important. Questions? Other questions? No? So I... Yes, Hubert. I have a stupid question. Your rush bar um, state for the gold 111 was not resolved as far as I could see in the experiment. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't show, show a nicer uh, spectrum. Sorry. That was Uh, we can we can resolve it at room temperature. Um, uh, so, but at that point it was not resolved. Yeah, it, it was not the not the best um, spectra we we can do. So that was initial spectra to to show that the um, spin resolve detector the spin detector um, functions correctly. So. So it it, uh, it worked even with less good uh, resolution. But don't worry, we, we can we can resolve it. It works quite well. Okay, thank you very much. So let's thank again uh, Christine. So I don't know if Laurent has asked you for your slides, but uh, we are collecting all the slides. So